five, four, three. Welcome to Janet's Planet, where we're traveling at the speed of thought, and I am so glad that you guys are joining us this morning. We've got a very special treat, which is my good friend, Miss Rachel Tillman. Her dad, James Tillman, worked on the Viking missions. If you've never known about them, you are going to walk away from today knowing a lot about the first ever rovers on Mars. So without further ado, let's put our hands together and put a give a big virtual welcome to Miss Rachel Tillman. Woo! Take it Good away, Rachel. morning. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody is nice and awake and excited. I know I am. Thank you, Janet. This was a really fun opportunity. So when Janet sent me a note, I said, oh yeah, do I want to speak to a bunch of bunch of bright young folks? So there's always a thumbs up in that department. So thanks you guys for taking your time and coming to listen to me. So um, first of all, as Janet explained, I was a really, really lucky kiddo. And as you can see on your screen now, are we sharing the PowerPoint? We sure are, it looks great. Okay, so what you see in front of you is a view of Mars from the very first spacecraft that landed on the surface of Mars in 1976. And what you see up on the top is an S-band antenna and a funny little chart that looks like a bunch of cubes of color that are very unclear. And that was a color chart. And on the left-hand side, you see a little bit of an American flag from a funny perspective. But these views of Mars were the first views of the surface of, planet, of the planet. So, what I want to share with you today is about the mission that brought us to the surface of Mars and the people that made it happen. So my inspiration was my father, who you see, the taller gentleman, and my son, the, the smaller fellow. Now, he's not quite that short yet anymore. He's now 15 years old. So I think we may have some folks to, right in that age range. And then the gentleman that worked on the mission with my father, Jerry Soffen, who you see in the foreground with the, the orange hat on, and Carl Sagan sitting to his left. And then I'm gonna use my cursor. Can you see my cursor there? And this little person here with the red shirt on is myself. This was in 1976. And this picture was taken at Cape Canaveral on the day of the launch actually the day before the launch of Viking One, sending it on its way to Mars for the very first time. So my inspirations were my father, Jerry Soffen, a dear friend, Carl Sagan, and all the other people that I was fortunate enough to grow up with. And my son is the person who inspired me to work with kids like yourself in this second part of my life career. Because I have actually been in computing and technology and um, the technical fields inventing stuff for the past, oh gosh, 30 something years. But it all begins with something that we love, right? Our passions start with the things that we really enjoy doing from your age all the way up to mine. So a little bit about me, I love to draw and to write and to invent things and to sing. So singing doesn't have a lot to do with Viking, but I guarantee you there were some fabulous musicians on that trip. And so one of the things to, that's really important to remember is that everybody who is working on a mission isn't just a scientist, engineer, technician, leader. They're lots of different things. They're multiple faceted people, just like all of you. Now, I wish I could see all of you, but it's hard to do that. Janet's got I'm juggling windows and, and presentations, so I'm going to leave that up to her. But just know that I'm, I'm here with you and I would love to answer questions as we go along um, in various points, I'll ask for questions. So one of the other things I love to do is I love to invent. So over here on the right-hand side, you're gonna see a, a screenshot of my very first uh, formal patent. So if anybody out there uses, uh, gee, let me think, technologies on uh, streaming, streaming media. So if anybody's virtually raising your hand, this patent is one of the patents that allows you to do some 
streaming uh, experiences, such as downloading things. So I love to invent in a nutshell. And I guess there's probably a lot of you inventors out there. So the, the, the question next is, what do you love to do? The most important thing to any mission is knowing what you love, being passionate and committed to it, building an amazing team because nothing happens alone. The best things happen through collaboration. And then the third thing is just to have fun. So these are a bunch of illustrations that I did over the years for various purposes. And I love to draw. So I said before that you can make things happen, and I was absolutely serious about this. Age does not matter. The, the item that you're seeing on the right is the third flight qualified spacecraft that was made to go to Mars. And the first two, Viking 1 and 2, were successful. So the third one, the flight spare, in case something happens to the other one, was left here on Earth. Now, in 1979, when I was 11 years old, I'm guessing there's some folks in there on our crew that are 11 or so. Oh, when yeah. I was 11 years old, I saved this Viking lander from being thrown away into a scrap pile, melted down into nothing. It's hard to believe that that would actually happen. But in fact, um, that's what a lot, that's what happens to a lot of things. So in 1979, NASA wasn't really thinking about aerospace history, but I was, because I found out that this item was being thrown, ready to be thrown away. And I thought, that's crazy. And my dad was the one that told me about it. And I said, well, I want it. And my dad said, honey, what are you going to do with a Viking lander? It won't even fit in our living room. And I said, dad, I want to put it in my school and I want to turn it into a, an, an educational tool so that kids can learn about science and engineering and Mars and robotics and all that kind of thing. And that's exactly what we did. My dad didn't let me off easy. though. He said, well, tell me what you're going to do about it. So I wrote him a proposal, not a real formal one because I was 11, but I did write him a, a proposal and I said, this is what we want to do. And that's exactly what we do. So we did. We put it in a building at my elementary school. My father would come to the school and talk about Viking. We did the first ever Lego robotics. Anybody in the group ever do Lego robotics? I know my son loves it. And these pictures are all from the 1979 very first Lego robotics, as far as we can tell. Um, and that's what we started doing in my, at my elementary school. So. In 1979, I really started this mission to preserve the history of Viking through its artifacts, oral histories, documents, and data. And the reason I did it is to inspire folks like you to be future leaders and thinkers. So you guys are already in that camp. You're, you are leaders and thinkers already. You just have to decide now, what do you want to lead, right? So after it was at my school for a while, we then moved it to the University of Washington Electrical Engineering. And let's see here. I'm going to minimize this so that I can see the rest of my slides. <laughs> there we go. And down here, you see these exhibit boards? So I developed those when I was away in school, and I, I designed them and had the guys at the University of Washington um, implement them. So throughout this whole journey, beginning at 11 years of age, I was actually working on saving history. And today, my Viking lander is on loan at the Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington. Now, do we have a crew of folks from all around the country, or are most folks out where you are? It's a bunch of people around the world. OK. Well, fantastic. Then, oh, well, I'm, I'm even more excited, because you're going to hear about international aspects of the mission. So what we do today is we do all sorts of fun things. We have curriculum for young folks to learn about building planets and, and space habitats. We have anniversary events where we invite the people that worked on the mission. Over here, we see a bunch of our Vikings that we've interviewed and done oral histories, and we do maker events. Down here, you see a bunch of folks gathered together to build a spacecraft, a Viking lander out of scrap material. Okay, We have kids as young as three years old, all the way up through adults. And that means us big kids. 
So all of these things we've been doing today, and one, I was super excited to add this experience to um, reach more folks. So thank you again, Janet, and all of you guys. The, the other thing that we did was, it was important to me to make all of the material from the Viking mission available to all of you. So we launched the very first online Viking exhibit. And this is just the very first of many to come, and I will send a link to, to Janet so that she can make it available to everybody. But you can already go online and Google Viking Preservation Cultural Institute, and you'll see all of these materials. This is just a real quick scan, including the people that worked in the mission. So it goes all the way from the beginning of the mission all the way through talking about a few of the folks. And again, this is just a little bit of a taste of what the mission was all about. So over time, we're going to add more and more archives, and you'll see some of those in my office a little later um, as we curate them, OK? So before we launch into the mission and how it began, um, Janet, do we want to take one or two questions about how I got to this point of starting our nonprofit? Or well, shall we just dive in? Well, here's a question that's coming in. How did you okay. get NASA? This is a great, this is a great story. Can you check and make sure your computer audio is completely off? We're hearing just a little bit of fragmenting, but while I ask you this question, just to make sure that uh, Jennifer Wagaman wants to know, how did you get NASA to give you the Viking Explorer? Like, how did you get that prototype? Yeah, so that's a great question. <laughs> And the answer to that is, if you work on a mission, if you work on a government project and you have certain access rights, if you're considered a government contractor or a government employee, um, you have access to what's called the, the, the scrap, the, the surplus um, website. It's a website now, it really wasn't then. Then it was just a list of numbers. <laughs> and um, so, my father was looking for a bunch of office files because he brought his homework with him, his work home with him every day. He was looking for some more file cabinets on the surplus list to see if he could buy us a couple of file cabinets for his office. And he saw this number, an article number, and that article number was for his meteorology instrument. Now, every single piece of the Viking lander, everything on it is labeled with a number. And you gotta you gotta know that these scientists that work on that worked on their specific parts, each one of them probably had the article numbers either memorized or readily handy. And so my father recognized, hey, this thing's from Viking. So he looked and looked into it and found out that his meteorology instrument was there. And then he started poking around more and found out that the entire Viking lander was actually available on surplus. And that's how we found out about it. And then it was a simple matter of putting my proposal together and then purchasing it from the scrap list. Now, you can't really do that anymore, unfortunately. So NASA has changed that significantly. But that's there how is, I got this. Uh, there is, however, a very uh, interesting website called Space Access. And there yes. are many NASA artifacts. The only thing is you have to uh, pay the shipping. So if you wanted a rocket to be in your front yard, you'd have to pay the shipping, which could probably be very expensive. Yeah. But uh, I'll, I'll I'll put that in the comments just so you guys can uh, uh, kind of like go around in that uh, website. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty exciting. It's done very differently now, but that was how it started, and and that's how I got the spacecraft. Any, any other quick questions before I launch into the mission? Let's launch into the mission. All right. So how did Viking begin? Back in the 1950s, there were all, people all around the world, and they were all interested in Mars because it was a fascinating planet that could be seen through telescopes, and people had been studying it for years. And when people started talking about the, the concept of going to Mars, they decided to meet together in Europe, in Germany, for the COSPAR meeting, the annual COSPAR meeting, which is the Council for Science Committee on Space Research, as you can see there. And that was the very first mission a discussion of what are we going to do when we go to Mars? It was really important then, just as it is today, for all of the nations of the world to agree on how we were going to explore space together. And that's the key word, together, right? Space belongs to everybody. 
It doesn't belong to one country or another, it belongs to everybody. So they met in, in Europe in, at the Coast Farm meeting and talked about what the, what the guidelines were going to be for exploring Mars. And at that time, a lot of people started on their own. Um, so all over the world at that point, people began to study for their own nations. What is it that we want to do? In the United States, they started immediately putting together a proposal to go to Mars. And it started out with the name Voyager. Anybody know the name Voyager? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So what's really funny is that the name Voyager came from the Viking team and then was borrowed later on. So the first mission to Mars was called the Voyager mission to Mars, and it was supposed to be you, uh, launched on a Saturn rocket. And um, it was approved. And then about six months later, it was actually, the funding was cut for it because the mission was too expensive and there wasn't going to be enough science on it. There's really only about two days of science on it. And, and that was too much cost, okay? So they cut that mission and immediately went to work because one thing a Viking never does is give up. So when they cut the funding, they didn't just go, oh gosh, I'm sad. They just dug their heels in and said, okay, let's come up with a new proposal. And that's exactly what they did. So in 19, uh, between 1965 really, and uh, 1969, they came up with the science objectives and a new spacecraft that would launch it. The, the science objectives, as you, as you can see here, are to obtain all of the, the images of the whole Martian surface, then to characterize the structure and composition of the atmosphere and the surface, and to search for life on Mars. How cool was that? So everybody wanted to know, is there life on Mars? One of the things you needed to do that is research. So there were people all over the world, as I mentioned, already doing research. So people were biologists and atmospheric scientists and radio scientists and people from all over the world contributed to this and co companies helped to bid to get the contracts for the mission. So we talked a little bit about, again about, about why we do that, what the science uh, objectives were, but then you had to think about, well, who's gonna do this? So, uh, and how are we gonna do it? So on one hand, we needed to identify researchers from all around the world and the country. We needed to figure out contractors who, would, who were not NASA, as well as the NASA centers that could design and test all of the incredibly intricate parts of these spacecraft, from the launch vehicle, to the orbiter, to the lander. And then we had to find companies that could actually manufacture them um, in a manner that would make them what we call flight ready, okay? or flight qualified. So those are really, really specific uh, companies and individuals that could do that. And indeed they did come from all over the world. Then on the other side, how we're gonna do this, they needed to come up with a budget. They needed to put that budget through Congress and get it voted on and approved. They needed to come up with the appropriate leadership that could lead this for a long time because the one thing we know about missions is it takes from five to 20 years to plan a mission and go through lots and lots of different options before you get to launch and then complete your mission. So it takes a lot of perseverance. We needed an, a communication system and we needed to um, figure out who's gonna operate all the different parts of that, okay? So at the end of the day, the NASA Langley Center won the project office. And this is really exciting because the two people bidding for the, the two NASA agencies bidding for it were, were Jet Propulsion Laboratories, who had all the Mariner spacecraft and Deep Space Network, and they were competing against NASA Langley. Well, NASA Langley was not as well known as JPL, but when they were preparing for the Apollo missions, everybody knows Apollo, right? When they were preparing for the Apollo missions, the, the people that worked to map the surface of the moon and successfully identify where to land, they weren't from JPL, they were actually from NASA Langley. So those researchers and, and grassroots um, bootstrappers and, and innovative folks, those actually came from NASA Langley um, to get that lunar orbiter is what it was called. And it mapped the surface and it was five missions, fully successful, it was amazing. So they won the, the project to um, manage the Viking mission. Now, the, the primary contractor for the 
spacecraft launch vehicle was Martin Marietta. They had a long history in uh, military missiles and so forth, and they petitioned to be the first space exploration launch vehicle, and they won that bid. They built an entire laboratory in Denver, Colorado, and moved their company and started a new um, uh, site there in, in Denver just to, to work on this Viking mission. It was pretty exciting. Really big move, a very, very bold move for them. Um, the orbiter, the mission was, uh, the orbiter was managed by JPL because they were the experts. They had the Mariner missions. They were great at it. And they also knew about deep space network and how to talk to those spacecraft when they were far, far away. So they were really good at that. And they were also associated with Caltech which means that they had a lot of uh, new students and, and academics all the time available to them. So the Viking lander contract was also given to Martin Marietta because they, again, they, they dedicated an entire lab and a giant group of people to work on this together. Instead of saying, well, we've got some people working on five or six other missions, but we'll give you a few to work on Viking. They said, nope, we're gonna dedicate our staff to working on the Viking mission. And then we've got the incredibly important Deep Space Network, which this mission absolutely cannot be done without communications. You can wave at the planets, you can jump up and down, you can have great spacecraft, but if you can't talk to them when they're flying there and do mid-course corrections and tell it when to take photos and when to scoop a, a little bit of so soil to, to test, we're not going to be anywhere. So those people had to be around the world. So to have line of sight, I want you to think about that in your heads, line of sight, you had to have locations, deep space networks sites in three different parts of the world. And so we did. Canberra, Australia, Madrid, Spain, and Goldstone, California. So those three locations had giant dishes that look a little bit like um, maybe, the, maybe the dish to get your cable from. <laughs> um, and they could talk to the spacecraft, both when it was uh, launching all the way through the cruise phase and when it was in orbit, and then again while it was in, in on the surface talking to us. So they were really, really important. And in fact, um, there are people in those networks that have saved every mission. So every mission that has had a, a hiccup, including Apollo 13, which is a really big deal right now, we're talking about that history, people around the world helped to save those missions because we know and challenges happen. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I want to interject here is everybody listening, taking a look at it took several offices, it took the partnerships, it took somebody building the launch vehicle, somebody building the orbiter, somebody building the lander, somebody putting together all the computing integration parts, and then partners within the deep space network. So when we think about it, it's like sometimes it's like only a few get lauded as like, oh, mission specialist or the person this, this. It is actually basically this neural network of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people on the ground making sure these missions go forward and and it's really important to note too that um when when countries launch missions they oftentimes they're represented as that country's mission but in fact viking was an international mission the chief scientist and the chief engineer were both from other countries. They, they were born in other places and educated in other places. And they came to the United States and they gifted us with that incredible education and knowledge. So it's really, really important to understand that it takes international cooperation to make these things happen too. So Viking wasn't just done by Americans, it was done by people all around the world. And the other thing that's super important for those of you that wanna work in aerospace, remember the jobs are at NASA, but they're also 80% of a mission is done at contractors that are not, that don't have the word NASA in front of them. Okay. So Martin Marietta is now Lockheed Martin and rocket research that developed the, the, the retro rockets is now called Aerojet Rocketdyne. We've got ULA, United Launch Alliance, We've got SpaceX, there's a whole bunch of different people. So you can work at NASA, but you can also work at these contractors. And that's a really important thing to remember. Awesome. So here you have a, a list of some of them, and I'm not going to, I'll stay on this for just a minute if you guys want to take a, a quick peek. So you've got the NASA centers on the left, and NASA Ames and Lewis and uh, Kennedy Space Center and Langley and JPL 
um, and, and Goddard, they were all an important part of the mission for different reasons. So the scientists, a lot of the scientists were actually at NASA Ames. They have an incredible group of scientists down there. Um, at, at Lewis, they helped to develop the Centaur stage, which is where the, the and you'll see this shortly, where that Viking and the orbiter were encapsulated in the front of the rocket, okay? So um, on, in the middle, you see a bunch of the different companies that worked for it, TRW, which is now north of Grumman, Honeywell, Bosch, lots of different companies. I could only list a few. And then on the right-hand side, it's really, really important to remember, and I'm going to put this little shout out for my father. He was at the University of Washington, and at the time when the mission was proposed, he was at MIT, he was a student. So he put in his first proposal to participate in the mission when he was still a student, okay? So all these academic institutes had people, both students and professors who were scientists and engineers and so forth, all working on the mission. So they weren't NASA employees, they were independent scientists and researchers, okay? Now the mission is made up of scientists and, and engineers, but there are also innovators and artists. There were programmers, storytellers, problem solvers, people that like to build stuff and writers. So I wanna kind of throw that out there for a second and, and look at those words and, and think to yourself, which of these am I? And if you have something else that you don't see up there, I want you to send Janet a note so that I can tell you a little later how you were involved. You're the thing that you love was involved in the mission, okay? So think about that for a second. Which of these things do you love to do? Because a mission takes all of these people, okay? So Viking started out at NASA Langley in a bunch of these trailers, as well as the NASA Langley centers. And there's a book called A Bunch of Plumbers by John Newcomb, who is, a dear friend of mine and, and, and has now passed. Um, and um, I helped work with him on this book to tell his personal story. And all of these individuals that you're seeing now, they worked on the Viking mission, both the men and the women, okay? So there were men and women working on Viking and not just in the, ro the role of computers, which you've probably heard of recently, um, and I can't see your hands raising, but you've probably seen uh, the role of the computers, the incredible women who were programming for real computers that you see on your, on your desktop that you have in front of you, um, were women that were calculating all these things. But Viking was a really unique mission because the, the head of it, the leader, set the culture of the mission. Jim Martin was his name. And he said, I want the best of the best. He didn't care where you were from, what gender you were, what your your background was some of the folks that worked on the mission didn't have college educations they were just brilliant okay so he wanted the best of the best and he created the one and only mission to this day that was a badgeless mission so when all of these people got together they didn't actually know where they came from they worked together as a team and that kind of collaboration is pretty unusual but he said that from the very beginning because he didn't want people thinking about did you come from JPL or Ames or TRW or University of Washington? He wanted everybody to think of themselves as Viking team members, right? So really important dates to remember. The original um, launch uh, was pushed from 1973 to 1975. Again, they faced some challenges, but they did not give up, right? They kept on going. When they launched in 1976, 75, the first a uh, major um, instance was the orbit insertion in, in June 19th of 1976, okay? So before it could land on the surface, the space uh, mission was designed so that it would go into orbit and image the entire planet from its uh, orbit. And that's what they did. On June 19th, they, were, they had orbit insertion. And then the site certification began in earnest. They looked at all the photographs from the Mariner missions and discovered they were very low resolution and the sites that they had originally picked didn't work. They were too bumpy, too many craters. So the likelihood of them landing safely was pretty slim. So between June 19th and the 1st of July, they had to figure out a new landing site. The original landing spot was, uh, it was supposed to be July 4th in celebration of the centennial. And the president was like, I wanna land on Mars in 
in July 4th, 1976, there's a big celebration about it, the, the, the centennial. But Jim Martin called the president and said, I'm sorry, sir, but we're not landing on July 4th. So they re-imaged re the surface, got higher resolution images, and they landed successfully on June, July 20th of 1976. The mission was designed for 90 days and it lasted, uh, uh, the extended mission lasted until 1981 when NASA no longer had funding for the mission because they were already working on Voyager, the space shuttle, Helios, and a whole bunch of other missions. And this is a really, this is where it becomes very personal. So when the when the funding was cut originally, it was extended twice. So you have to you have to propose extended missions in order to get them. In 1981, there was really no more funding left. So my father, whose Viking meteorology instrument was still working fine, said, "You can't turn my my system off." <laughs> and so he and a number of other people uh, banded together, and he proposed to run the mission from his office at the University of Washington working with a select and small group of amazing Vikings down at JPL and scientists at Ames and other locations to keep the lander alive. So in 1981, my father became the mission director for Viking. And then he had weekly meetings with his team uh, from the University of Washington office and the folks at, in uh, JPL. And he had to negotiate them for uplink and downlink time. We'll talk about that kind of thing later. So. It, at that point, it became very personal. My father was, was running the mission. Now, the mission continued for another um, couple of years until the spacecraft, the, the orbiters eventually um, did have issues and, and were end of life. And the very last day of the mission in November of 1982, um, the, a signal was sent to the antenna on Mars that accidentally turned it away, and we could no longer speak to Vikings. That was a really sad day. And I remember that evening well, because my father actually um, got a call and um, was informed that that happened. And that's when I heard the term tiger team for the first time. And they set up a small group of, of people to try and bring it back to life and to try and reach the antenna somehow. And unfortunately they were unable to, but they had six years of data. The, plan the mission was planned for 90 days and they got six years, okay? Not only did they get six years out of a 90-day mission, but they were the first to land successfully on the surface. Others had tried. So the Soviet Union actually landed on the surface of Mars, but it was not a soft landing, and it only lasted for about 20 seconds. But even that was a success. So it's really important when you do a project for the first time um, and you're successful to acknowledge all of the people that tried before you and maybe didn't reach your level of success, but you learn from them, right? So we all learn from our mistakes and from the things that don't go wrong, that don't go right. Some things are completely out of our control and we didn't know anything about Mars, not much about Mars before we landed there. So we have to give um, uh, recognition to those that came before us. So we landed successfully on the surface of Mars. We took the first image from the surface of the planet. We mapped the entire surface of the planet and all six spacecraft, two launch vehicles, two orbiters and two landers with all their instrumentation worked. That's pretty unbelievable. And if you ask the Vikings, they will tell you the same thing. <laughs> they, some of them said, we knew it would work, but most of them said, we knew it could work, but we knew we also had to have luck on our side. And indeed they did. So there were science, a lot of different science instruments, uh, biology, chemistry, meteorology, seismology, magnetic properties, and physical properties. And um, they discovered seasons on Mars and that Mars, um, the atmosphere of Mars was mapped for six years, which gave us a baseline to land all of the other missions that came after Viking successfully. We needed to know more about the atmosphere in order to try different ways of landing, right? So after Viking, we've had, we've had Phoenix, we've had um, recently Insight, we had Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity, and we've had some other attempts that didn't make it as well. But it's really tricky landing on the surface of another planet. And so that atmospheric data was incredibly important. And, Good question. And, uh, so yeah, sorry to interrupt. It's like, has the Soviet okay. Union, do they have any, does Russia have any rovers? 
on Mars. Mm -hmm. Russia sent uh, some probes to Venus uh, that only right. lasted about 110 minutes, but I don't think that Russia currently or has, has ever attempted anything on Mars, to my knowledge. Oh, yes. Yes, oh, they, they did. They, okay. Yeah, Russia, the Soviet Union were the first ones to land, but not successfully, unfortunately. They landed, but then they shut down. They, they sort of crashed. We, we call it a soft landing and a not so soft landing, but they, they were there, they did land, um, but, but unfortunately they didn't get any data. So um, uh, Viking was the first to land successfully and at this point is the only one to search for life, meaning biologic uh, organics, okay? So there's a lot of different ways we talk about the search for life. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And Spirit Opportunity and Curiosity have done a lot of other things such as incredible imaging way beyond the capacity of Viking. They have cameras and, and that, that, uh, that Viking can't match, but that was, you know, over 20 years later before we were successfully able to repeat uh, a, meet, um, a mission that landed successfully on Mars. Um, so those are the, some of the precedents. Now, the Viking spacecraft was pretty unique. Um, up in the, the upper left-hand corner, you can see the, the, um, the last stage, which holds the Centaur, which is a center module, and it holds the, the lander and the orbiter, and they're encapsulated together. Now, one of the important things to think about was if you're going to search for life, you need to make darn sure. Now you see it on the right hand side and on the left, actually. The encapsulation process, if you see that tube on the left and right, that funny little disc right here, this is the lander inside an aero shell and bio shield, okay? And then this part here is the is the orbiter, and it doesn't look like an orbiter because the, the solar arrays are not extended. You'll see pictures later where they are. But this entire module had to be encapsulated after it was sterilized. So to look for life on another planet, you have to think about, are we bringing life with us? That's something that you'll hear about a lot today because Viking is the only spacecraft that has been sterilized now there's a diff and the, and the difference is sterilizing and sanitizing. Sanitizing is wiping things down with chemicals, kind of like wiping off your table. Um, but if you have a wooden table like the one I have in front of you, you're not gonna wanna sterilize it the way they did for Viking because they stuck it in an oven at over 360 degrees. <laughs> so that was the difference between sanitizing and sterilizing. All of these items within the, the, the module, the Viking lander module had to be sterilized. Now, when it, when it entered the atmosphere, um, the idea was that anything that might be on the aeroshell would actually burn off any organics, but everything inside of the, the, the aeroshell and bioshield had to be sterilized, okay? That was really, really an important piece. That was very unique. So the Lewis Research Center um, was a really important part of that ex uh, experience. Now, the engineering and testing, part of this. You see these fun dials? I love this stuff. I love old systems. <laughs> All of the things that you do on your computer today with a couple of buttons on a screen, or in my case, probably a lot of you guys also have touch screens, just like you do on your phones. Maybe you're watching us from your phone. Um, All those things were done with dials back then. Okay. Now this little thing here, which is hooked up to a bunch of dials. This is actually the retro, the lander retro rocket. And this is a test unit. And I have one in my office that I'll show you in a little bit. And it's hooked up to this meter over here because what they needed to, to test were how the, the, the um, fuel, the hydrazine was going to be injected into the nozzles. They had to know the force and they had to know exactly how much hydrazine to inject to get the right kind of firing and ignition so that they could land successfully, okay? Nobody had landed a vehicle successfully on another planet. And the other trick was it had to land autonomously. So raise your hand virtually if you know what autonomously means. It means doing something without human intervention, okay? Or a, a soul unit doing it. So Viking had to land all by itself without people on a console saying, turn left, turn right, no, no, wait, stop, slow down. Like on Apollo, when they were landing on the moon, they actually had that ability to do a manual landing. On Viking, there was no such thing. Everything had to be programmed. An entire 90-day sequence had to be programmed by incredibly bright computer programmers to do the, the, the orbit entry, the landing, and all the science experiments. So think about that. 
when you program your next um, uh, app or or game or whatever it is that you like to program, think about planning, pro programming something that you have to put in a spacecraft and send away, and you can't ch you can't change it, you can't do anything to it. You have to program it perfectly the first time because you can't touch it once you're once you're launched. All right. So the testing and engineering was an incredibly important part of this of the mission. And that was done at a number of different places. Martin Marietta and TRW at the time and uh, NASA Ames were responsible for a lot of the scientific instrumentation. And in this case, these are the RTGs. Um, does anybody know what a radioactive thermoelectric generator is? Raise your hand. If you don't, that's totally okay. I didn't actually know what it was until I was much older. But this was the power source on the lander that allowed it to not only uh, control and operate the systems because solar panels were unreliable, was deemed unreliable on the surface of Mars because there was much dust. We knew that there was dust because we'd seen dust storms. They didn't want to rely on that as a sole source of energy. So they put RTGs on it. And um, these RTGs are radioactive. And so they did some tests on them. This is kind of a funny story. I said, what kind of tests did they do? And one of the tests that they did was they put it on a train track and they ran it over this module here with a train. They, they crashed into it with a train, kind of crazy. But this was back in the 1970s. So they had to do all kinds of creative things to, to simulate what might happen. And it was actually fine. Pretty tough, tough part of the, the spacecraft there. Okay, so the other part is the science. So there was science on both the orbiter and the lander. The science platform on the orbiter included a camera imaging, water vapor mapping, which was called the MOD, um, and the surface thermal mapping. So they needed to, they were able to, to actually image the planet using thermal cameras and, and data to interpret um, to some extent what the, the makeup of the atmosphere and the surface were uh, through those cameras. And then to identify how much, how much moisture was in the air and in the environment. Um, then you get to the lander. So this is our lander, um, a, a, a for one of the first drawings of the lander. Um, and it gives you all of the different science instruments. So I talked to, just mentioned them su very superficially. Here we've got the cameras in the middle. Can, can everybody see what I'm pointing to here? It looks like the center of the vehicle, the deep down center yeah. is where you are. Yeah, can you see the cursor? Uh huh. Okay, perfect. So these are the two cameras. These are facsimile cameras. Okay. Anybody heard of a fax machine? Mm -hmm. You know that noise? <laughs> so when your scanner does that, okay, imagine that these two cameras are essentially scanners and they operate by scanning left to right. And they did, they made those noises too. Um, you know, I'm in outer space. But, but everything back then made noises, all the mechanicals do. But so these were essentially fax, uh, facsimile cameras and they scan from left to right. Now the joke was that, that if you were standing over here and the camera had already passed you. So if you had a little Martian walking around behind it and the camera had already started scanning, it could follow the scan and never be in the camera picture, the line of sight. So that was one of the jokes that Carl Sagan actually made. And, and a lot of the people who were developing the cameras had fun with that as well. Um, so then you have here in this area, you have the GCMS, the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, which was the instrument that was going to under, help us to understand the chemical makeup of the um, surface of the planet. That was really important because in any um, environment, physical environment, you have both chemical and biological processes. And so those two things needed to work together to um, figure out if we could find life. And here we have the X-ray fluorescent instrument, which is which was really neat. It basically x-rayed the material found on the surface to identify what kind of mineral elements were inside the surface of, of the planet, were on the surface of the planet. And each of these had a an entry unit, a, a little collector head. Uh, this is the x-ray funnel, okay? And um, all of the surface material was scooped up here in the collector head and then dumped into the funnels in order to test those materials. 
Now this one here is the biology processor and there were three biology in, uh, instruments experiments inside the, in the biology uh, instrument as a whole. We'll talk about those a little bit later, but there's all kinds of other science. There's also a radar altimeter. Um, we had a, uh, and it, you can't see it here, but we've got a seismology instrument. Okay, those of you that saw uh, Insight Land last year, re more recently, somebody accidentally said that Insight was the first seismometer on Mars, but that was not actually true. So Viking had the very first seismometer on Mars. Then you also had um, the uh, S-band antenna, and I can't show you that one because it's actually in my son's room and he's asleep right now. Oh, there's the seismometer, a little piece of it right here. Uh, but that's not really what it looks like. Um, and then you had UFH antennas. Uh, there was a lot of different communication um, uh, elements to the spacecraft. So they had low gain antennas and high gain antennas in case they lost uh, the ability to communicate one way, which in fact did happen. So when we lost our orbiters, we had to talk directly to um, the Viking lander on the surface of Mars and we were ready. They did it. Okay. So these are just a few of the images that represent the science. And of course, there was humor in the mission. It was really important in a stressful mission like this that everybody maintains some amount of humor because things will go wrong. So there were a whole bunch of artists, remember I showed you that earlier, a bunch of artists on the mission. And some of them decided to create logos for every different um, team, science team. And uh, you'll see more of these, not just the science teams, but the mission teams as well. Okay, now the meteorology instrument, um, which my father developed, this is a schematic for that, um, was also really important because it showed us, it, we got the, the first weather reports from the surface of Mars and Seymour Hess, the head of the meteorology team actually would start the morning off with a weather report. And um, we will get some tapes of those that we'll be putting out there for you to hear too. Um, so what was it like on the surface of Mars in June? And as I said, we discovered that there were in fact seasons on Mars. Um, again, humor was really important. Sven became one of the mascots by uh, one of the artists that, that uh, was a part of the mission. And, and so you'll see a lot of Sven around, okay? And the biology, okay? Again, humor was important. Um, the results that we got back from the mission you hear a lot of different things. Did we find life? Did we not find life? There is still a controversy about this. In fact, a lot of people, uh, initially, the results came in from the, the, the labeled release instrument and the, the results for that instrument were actually positive. So according to the way that the scientific instrument was designed, the results that they got back from the surface of Mars on Sol 13 was that we had in fact had an organic response and we had found life. Okay, so it met the requirements for that instrument. Now later on, they had there were um, there were controversies um, based on the different the the agreement of all the instruments that couldn't be resolved. So at the end of the day, the the result about life on Mars was reported in a lot of different ways because people interpret information differently. But what NASA said was we cannot conclude that we have found life. They didn't say we didn't find life. They said we cannot conclude that we did find life. And that's a difference. And I would go into that, I could do an entire hour on the biology alone, but I can't do that. So, um, so we didn't not find life, how's that for double negative? But we couldn't conclude, um, uniformly across all of the instruments that we did find life. So we had to leave it um, with that at the moment, but there, the data is still being uh, researched. We're providing information to people. We will actually make all of the Viking uh, material that is um, all the science results available. Um, some of it is available already and we'll, we'll continue to make that available as it's processed for people to continue to study. But there are efforts right now studying the, the gas chromatograph and chemistry um, uh, results that indicate that there might in fact um, have been uh, an interference that, that determined that the, that instrument could not see some of the material that was necessary to determine if it was or was not life. So one of the really exciting things about the search for life 
is that for the first time in history, a woman was the uh, lead investigator, co-investigator for the search for life. That's pretty darn cool. It was back in 1976. So her name is Dr. Patricia Ann Stratt. And this is her book over to the right. And um, uh, I helped her publish that book just January of last year, it came out. And she talks all about her search for life. This is a pic picture of Pat, that developing the instrument. Here she is down at TRW, adjusting things and, and developing the scientific instruments, the processes, et cetera, working with the engineers at TRW. There were a lot of people that worked on this. And it was exciting because she was a young woman leading a scientific investigation on Mars. And she wasn't just a scientist. She was also a master woodworker, a photographer, and an equestrian. So that's her jumping her horse, Shadow Facts. So for those of you out there that like to do a lot of different stuff, keep doing all those different things that you do. Keep your art interest in arts and outdoor activity because all of those things will help you. Every day before she went into work at JPL during the mission, the, the, the primary mission, she would go across the street first to the stables and ride her horse. And that gave her the opportunity to clear her mind and to think about the things she needed to do for the day. She got up at like four or 5 a.m. So that may not be for the faint of heart, but uh, Pat was a pretty amazing, is a pretty amazing woman. You know how um, that, so uh, that works perfectly yeah. with what we heard with from astronaut Hoot Gibson on Friday. Remember he said, you know, you guys were asking, what do I need to do to become an astronaut? And he clearly just kind of reiterated what Rachel said, or she reiterated what he said on Friday, is that choose something you love and being interested in multiple things helps your brain work in many different facets. I love that. I've got to get that book. Where can they get that book? So if you want to get the book, you can go to a website called, uh, it's www.tomarswithlove.com. <laughs> pretty, pretty straightforward. <laughs> and you can actually purchase that. And right now, actually, I, I, if you send um, a message to Pat, um, at here, here we go. We're gonna do something special. Send a message to Pat at info at to marswithlove.com and tell her that you learned about her book here. And um, if you, if your folks decide to purchase a book, tell her that you learned about the book here and put in the header of your email. Okay, this is gonna be kind of, I'll send it to you too. Um, hashtag. Uh, let's see, what, how did we set it up? I wasn't ready for this. So save me W, which means with literature, okay? Because there's a lot of people cooped up in their houses right now. And we just, um, Pat just launched a special price. So you can actually get her book for like $9 off, like 30% off um, right now. If you put hashtag save me W literature <laughs> in in the and um, but tell her in the email that you learned about it here and that you're a student that really is interested and she'll send you an autographed copy of the book. Okay, so cool. um, yeah, that's some, that's just kind of a fun aside. So and um, just so you know, we yeah. usually stop around ten fifteen, and I want to make sure we've got time for questions and your tour. So uh, we're, uh, okay, yeah. So well, we can go all the way to ten thirty. So it's just I just want to let you know where we are and how much ever we're, we're we're all in. So whatever you want to okay. do. Okay. Well, you you'll have to keep me out. You'll have to be my my time police because I'm not good at this. I could talk about this forever, but I want to hear from you guys too. So we talked a little bit about the cameras and the meteorology instruments. So I'm gonna just kind of skip through here pretty quick. But all of these illustrations, so when I said artists, I was serious. We need people in missions to draw the instruments before they get turned into real test instruments like this, okay? So we need artists, all right? So again, I talked about these fun logos that people did. The computing was fascinating. So in order to take a picture on the surface of the planet, everything was done on paper back then. We didn't have the computers the way we did now. We had sequencers on, on the lander and the orbiter. They weren't true computers because there was no parallel processing at that time. So in order to get a picture, see this little red line around here? The science team and the mission director, Jim Martin, sat around in a room and decided what they wanted to take a picture of or what they wanted to, where they wanted to uh, take a photograph. And this, both of these views 
they tell you what the camera POVs, point of views are, okay? And so everything you're seeing here is basically looking from the camera out. So they would circle on the grid what they wanted to take a picture of, and then they would take it. So you see over here, this is a corresponding photograph to that little square. So this on Sol 1, Sol 0, which is the first day they were there, when they landed, they sat down together and they figured out in advance, this is what they wanted to um, take a photograph. And this is the very first picture. This actual notebook has the very first picture. It's one of our artifacts. Um, and, um, but that's how they did it. They sent the computer coordinates, right? So if you guys want to learn about coordinates and graphs in math, study that stuff and you can figure out how to take pictures on different planets, okay? It's pretty cool stuff. Coordinates are really interesting. So there were definitely challenges. There were days on Viking when things did not go right. But again, the teamwork and the focus on the goal was what made the, 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 um, the mission successful. No matter what happened, they worked together. And in order to minimize those, they had incredible integration processes. So these, I'm gonna show you three graphs, but pretty quickly. Each one of these represents different kinds of tests, how all the different aspects had to be tested together, okay? You've got sterilization at, uh, at, uh, the, at the Cape Canaveral. We've got sterilization in the um, assembly. We've got combat compatibility testing integrity testing, which means when I bounce this stuff around, is it going to break? Um, our next one, our next diagram talks about the, the smaller parts of the spacecraft and how they all get um, uh, assembled together. So, so we've got parachutes going on the lander. This was a, a, a plan, okay, a very high level plan. Again, illustration is really important. A lot of people can't visualize things from words. So how all of these things are gonna happen had to be put together in a picture like this. And you can even see here, here's the orbiter before it extends its um, solar panels. And there it is after it extends solar panels. What's happening, okay? The orbiter communicates to KSC, oh, we've arrived. And then the, the automated mission extends the solar panels. And at that point, it can talk in a different manner. So all of these plans had to be done in advance. In fact, years in advance. Um, in order to do some of the testing, they had two different test capsules. One is called the uh, engineering test capsule. And the other one is called the proof test capsule. capsule. And there was one more called the, the CT, the com computer ca test. But the computer test wasn't an actual physical thing. But there's proof test capsules and um, engineering tests. And one of them is in the Viking, one of them is, one of the test uh, modules is in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum now. So getting to Mars. First, you have to do a bunch of math, and I'm not gonna go into all of this, but again, if you, those of you who like math, you guys are so important. If we don't have you on the mission, we're gonna skip right off of that atmosphere and go into outer space. So we need you guys, okay? You are really, really important. Um, it, it also takes um, uh, communications folks, people that like information and data. And um, here we are at Cape Canaveral. This is watching the launch. So I was there at the Cape, as you saw in that first picture, watching the launch, and it was the most incredible experience. I mean, the roar of the launch vehicle, everything, it, it just, it sticks with you. So um, here it is from a distance. We were somewhere over here, I think. I don't remember, I was 11, but, <laughs> but it was an amazing, it was an amazing uh, experience watching the launch. Now we talked a little bit about the, the um, communications uh, tracking stations around the world. This is what they looked like, okay? This is the antenna in Goldstone, California, but they had tracking stations in Canberra, Goldstone, and Madrid, Spain, again, all around the world. Now, I also mentioned that when they got to Mars in orbit, they realized that they couldn't land in their original site that they were gonna land in, and they had to re, they had to, figure out again where they want to land. And what that's called is site selection. So when they select a site, they actually select a large area within which they're going to land. So this area is quite large and I don't remember, um, it's, let's see, it says 326 by 533 
kilometers. Um, so think about wherever you're standing, think about somebody all the way across the country. Now, if you were gonna throw a dart that you wanted to go to their house, you wouldn't just aim at their house because you might go through a window. You'd wanna aim maybe at their doormat so you could ring the doorbell. So this is essentially the doormat. It's, a, it's an, an area that was large enough that we could hit it, but small enough that you would end up in an area that was somewhat safe to land, that you had deemed safe enough to land in. And um, these were the original sites that were selected. None of them were actually chosen. Um, uh, Christ Planitia, which is, which is where the uh, Viking one did end up landing. And here is the first picture taken from the surface of Mars. And you see this little monitor in the corner. Um, so I was there for launch, but I was also there for landing. So I was at Jet Propulsion Laboratories and I was in a, in a, a room with about five to 10 other people that were family members of scientists. There was also a, a, uh, another room with a bunch of folks in it. And this is what we were watching, Viking separation. And then we knew that about 20 minutes later, it would have landed, but we didn't know that it landed. We had to wait 20 minutes after it landed until we first, till it, it booted itself up autonomously. So artificial intelligence, Viking was the first artificial intelligence pre-programmed. So it did everything on its own. It had to decide, the retro rockets had to decide how fast to slow down. I mean, how much to slow down using the radar altimeter and the, and the, the sequencer on board that sent it data real time. Do I need to slow down? As I get closer and closer, I'm gonna slow down, right? So this was the first AI that actually was ever uh, launched into space. Pretty exciting stuff. So and the then, question is coming, how old were you when it launched? And then how old were you when it landed? Okay, I was 10 years old when it launched in 1975. And I, well, I was almost 10. And then I was almost 11 when it landed. So nearly two years apart. So we're talking basically two. No, years. actually, no, no, it was nine, nine months, actually. Nine it just happened months. to be, yeah. So it landed, it launched in September and landed in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, July of 90, 1976, so about nine months. Um, that, that part, that, yeah. So we have, a, within each year, we have 12 months to choose from. So it was about a nine month travel. Um, and so two spacecraft um, were in, were in uh, one was in orbit, Viking one was in orbit while Viking two was launched so that both were actually being operated simultaneously. It was pretty wild. So when this first picture came down, we already had a second lander on its way to orbit insertion, but it hadn't quite gotten there yet. And at, at four, five, six a.m., this very first picture came in and it drew itself one line at a time. Up in the upper left-hand corner, you can kind of see those lines, right? See those lines up there? It wasn't real clear. And I remember when the first few lines came in, Imagine that you can't see anything but this part of the photograph. It was blurry. And I, I remember distinctly the, there being a little bit of a hubbub, worried that the cameras might, might not be working. But in fact, they were. And by the time they started seeing rocks, Al Hibbs and Tim Much, who was the, the, um, on the imaging team, head of the imaging team, they uh, started announcing real time. Oh, we see rocks. And then they started talking about it. And we have that uh, interview and we'll be putting that out there as well. And eventually we saw the foot pad. Now the same thing, we did the same thing a few months later, September 3rd with Viking 2. And you can see the difference there. So I'm gonna leave this up for a second and I want you to look at the top picture, Viking 1 landing and Viking 2. And just make some notes to yourself about the differences, a couple of differences that you notice. And then send those to Janet. And, um, and later on through email or some other means, we'll figure out, I wanna, I wanna hear what you guys notice. And we can ex explain some of what you're seeing, some of the differences that you're seeing, okay? But I, I'm not gonna give you any clues. So just a couple more seconds uh, to take a look at that. And then I'm gonna skip to the next slide. All right, three, two, one, conjunction. <laughs> so when Viking was launched, the 90 day mission that I mentioned ended at what's called conjunction. So that's when the planet 
goes behind the sun and we can't talk to it anymore. So it had the entire sequence of science instrumentation had to be planned to be completed autonomously in case we couldn't talk to it. It ended up that we could, but in case it couldn't, we had to have that all completed before conjunction. And then our little lander went behind the sun. So life after Viking. Um, we know, some of you guys know about missions that have been there um, uh, since Viking. Probably most of you know about the rovers, right? But the first rover that was designed for, to land on Mars was actually designed using my lander, the Viking 3, which looked sort of like this. <laughs> This is a little hand, a little model, it's about six inches wide. And the guys were having fun in the office one day having a little rover battle. But the, the original um, rover, they were gonna take my lander and put, we put treads on it like this. See the little treads on this little guy? So they were gonna put treads on it. And that was going to be the first lander. But in fact, that couldn't get funded because of the uh, other exciting missions like the space shuttles and Voyager and a lot of other cool things. So, so the things that Viking influenced today, and up here, see here on the left-hand side, this was one of the proposals that was written to turn my Viking 3, my VL3, into a rover, and you can actually see the treads that they put on here. Again, it wasn't funded, but that's, that's okay. You can see some more details. There were three or four proposals put together by different entities, Martin Marietta, uh, JPL, um, uh, TR, TRW, a lot of different groups actually had proposals. This was another proposal for a rover. So Viking actually was um, influenced everything that's happening today. The spacecraft, uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin, which you've probably heard of, the retro engines that land and can be reused, that uh, concept, the throttleable engines that are landing through um, a radar altimeter, which measures how far they are from the surface, to the to the um, from the engines and that ability to throttle and fire um, uh, based on the information it's receiving as it lands that was developed for the landers the Viking landers to land on Mars so that is still being used today by lots of different people. Um, Carl Sagan, who you see here, um, work was the one that started the Cosmos program. So you guys probably know Neil deGrasse Tyson, who does Cosmos now. But Carl Sagan was the original producer and narrator for that. And he was on the Viking uh, imaging team as well. So we've got Spirit, Opportunity, we've got Blue Origin, and all around the world, people were excited about it. So this is a magazine done in Japan about Viking. Um, here we have uh, uh, Bruce Murray, Carl Sagan, um, Lou Friedman and one other gentleman, and I can't tell who it is because it's too small for me to see, uh, who started the Planetary Society. Planetary Society was started by Vikings. Um, and they are alive and well today and they, they do great work, communications work. Um, now, one of the people that is working on missions, has worked on every single Mars mission that the United States has done is this gentleman over here on the right, his name is Dr. Benjamin Clark. And he worked on the Viking mission and he's worked on every other mission since then. And when I was uh, sitting doing my interviews uh, with him, he had to excuse himself for a few minutes to go and hop onto a meeting with Curiosity. So I sat in on that meeting with Curiosity while they talked about whether they were going to drive forward, go to a new place, or whether they were gonna do some more tests where they were. So that was pretty exciting for me. So I got a little insight from Viking all the way to um, uh, Curiosity, pretty cool stuff. So the other thing that you may recognize here, um, it, this is a scanner. Uh, they still kind of look like that actually. Com <laughs> cameras, a few of them still look like this, but most of you probably have them in your phones. And those cameras in the CCD, this particular part of the camera was actually developed by the Viking imaging team, okay? So everything that, there's so many things in the items that you use today that were developed for the Viking mission. It's absolutely mind boggling. So. The other thing that it takes is not just a bunch of instrumentation, but it takes individuals with different characteristics. And these are some of the characteristics that were uniform in all of the people that I've interviewed. I've interviewed over 300 people that worked on the mission, including of course, my father. They were visionaries, they were passionate, they took risks. A lot of times you don't do something because you think it might not work. Well, the best lessons are learned by doing something 
seeing how it doesn't work, fixing it and making it better. Okay. So we have a, in our organization, the Viking Mission, Mars Missions Education Preservation Project, we have a motto and that is failure is required. Okay. If you fail a whole bunch of times and then you succeed by making iterative changes, little tiny changes, one at a time, the end result is going to be so much better than your first attempt. So don't give up. Don't give up whatever you do. Did I see a hand go up? Did you have a, did you want to ask a question? Uh, Jen? Oh, you know what? It's like I was typing very fast to just put that in our notes that failure is okay. required. Keep making iterative changes. I think yeah. this is so great. Now we are coming up about 10 10. Uh, okay. You're, we may have to invite you back to go back in your office because I know <laughs> <laughs> we have to have you back next week to talk more about this. <laughs> Because what you're sharing is so beautiful and amazing. I, I certainly don't want to miss anything out. So let's get to the end of your proposal, take some questions, and we may come back next okay. week for round two. Okay. Hey, I'm game. <laughs> <laughs> I am quite literally not going anywhere. How about the rest <laughs> of you? <laughs> okay. So um, the other thing that it takes is creative thinking. So um, this may sound a little crazy, but a lot of people, myself included, don't, when they, when you go to class every day, you don't necessarily feel like all of your peers. Some, some of us feel different, right? We think differently. We see things differently. And sometimes people don't, people make you feel not so great about that. But what I'm going to tell you is that the missions that are successful are successful because of people who feel different and look at the world differently, okay? Those people are incredibly special and we need them. We need all of you, all right? So some of the individuals that worked on Viking really were not comfortable with people. One gentleman in particular, uh, he was brilliant mathematician. So he would get his work um, slid under the door. <laughs> he would do all the work inside his closed door office. He'd slide the results out and then he would go out to his um, van and drive off and camp in a, in a park. And he lived in his van during the Viking mission. Brilliant guy, absolutely brilliant. Um, and actually last I heard, he still does, um, which is pretty cool. Um, we had folks that, um, were, that were not able to um, read and write particularly well, but they were brilliant mathematicians. We had a lot of writers and people with vision, but they couldn't do math. So the, the important thing to think about is everybody who is passionate and has their own unique spark and skill has a place to explore space, all right? So if you want to do this, there's something out there for you, all right? The other thing that was really critically important, I mentioned it before, is cooperation and teamwork. Um, you're not necessarily going to be, as I said, like the people that are on your team. You're not going to, everybody's different. You're not going to agree upon everything outside of your work. Your, your personal life views are gonna be different. And that was true on Viking as well. We had people from all over the world, all different religious backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, first languages, all sorts of different people. But they cooperated because they kept their mind on the goal, okay? The most important thing was the, the goal that they had, okay? And they, they worked together, they cooperated through all of their dis, other disagreements, they cooperated and they worked together. And then they were committed to research and education. And that's really important because a lot of times today, people don't research things deep enough. They go to the internet and they read a few things. They assume that what they read on the internet is true, which is really dangerous. And then they make their decisions based on that. I want you guys to think of a concept and you probably, a lot of you already know this. In fact, I'm sure most of you do, but um, I, I didn't when I was your age and that's called primary sources. So don't just look at secondary sources like reports and stuff. Look at primary sources, talk to people that are actually doing the research and listen to opposing views so that you can figure out through a lot of different perspectives, not just two opposing views, but a whole bunch of different ideas around things, what might actually work best, okay? 
So here's, a, I'm gonna show you a few slides of the people that worked on Viking. So these are folks that worked at the NASA Langley Research Center and um, wonderful dear folks. Um, this gentleman here, Klaus Beeman, is in front of the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. He was a student at MIT and then a professor at MIT in chemistry. Um, wonderful gentleman and, um, and his son, uh, Hans Peter was actually there at JPL during the mission as well, like we were. He was just a few years older than me and a photographer. So he took some amazing pictures of the people on the mission. And I'm just gonna give that little shout out to Hans Peter, thank you. Um, and wonderful family. And he has shared some of those images with us and, and also made a book about that. So um, uh, we have here, Jerry Soffen, who was the chief scientist, along with another uh, a group of individuals that worked on the mission. and. Um, Jerry Soffen was not just the chief scientist, he was also a magician. So when we would go down to visit him and go to his house for dinner um, and then just kind of hang out, I would follow him around like, Jerry, Jerry, do another magic trick. <laughs> and he did, he was pretty cool, all right? He was a wonderful guy. Um, so um, the people, again, who worked on the mission were so many, had so many facets to them. This is Tim Much. He was on the imaging team. He was a brilliant and dedicated person who had a really unique idea. And that was to bring student interns onto the mission. So he and Carl Sagan and um, Jerry Soffen all agreed to start the Viking intern program. So this group here is just one of four groups of students. So they were between 19 and 22 years old. They were fresh out of high school in some cases, and they went to work directly on the Viking lander, okay? Now they worked for the summer, um, one or one to four months on the mission. And some of them, a lot of them stayed in oh, aerospace. Oh no, you're frozen. You're frozen. Uh -oh. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, oh. you froze for a second. And I tell you, let's do this because it's like some of my kiddos have to go to another class, but here's ah, what okay. I wanna do. So let's remember this because these guys are so integral to the mission. And I, what yeah. I love about Dr. Benjamin Clark's story is I wanna talk to the kids about that. So I think yeah. we're gonna save the rest of your presentation and the tour of your office for one day next okay. week. If you will uh, do this for me, stop the screen sharing on your computer, and then we can take a few questions in the next 10 minutes. Uh, and okay. I already see Lucas's hand up here. All right, Lucas, coming straight for you, buddy, old pal. Lucas, what's your question this morning? My question is, who designed, um, who made, um, who, who, um how did they tell what how how did they tell curiosity to walk um did so, they so uh, it's they, like, how did they make ro the rover move yep yeah curiosity well that's a great question and it took a whole lot of different people to make it move um similar to viking um, I'm not an expert on curiosity. So one thing that's really important to learn, and you see a lot of adults doing this, actually, I bet. Every one of you can think about a time when you saw an adult pretend to be an expert about something that they weren't an expert about. So I'm not an expert, but <laughs> what I can tell you is that they sent signals, just like on Viking, to the spacecraft to give it commands to roll forward, and it moved forward on treads. Now, as far as who did it, a whole lot of people. <laughs> and that's the, you know, honestly, that's the best answer I can give you. I could tell you a bunch of names, but um, I can probably get some of the folks that worked on Curiosity and Viking to come back and do a little meeting together for you guys. Oh, so, um, that would be maybe, awesome if we could yeah. have a few Vikings yeah. on here and that well, kind of thing. And, and maybe have some Vikings and some Curiosity folks together on a call talking to each other about how Viking influenced them. So that's a possibility. Oh, I'm seeing something okay. great. Let me come back around. Uh, I see your hand again. Anybody, Jack, 
Jesse, Ander, anybody? Hey, Carl, my good friend, Major General Carl Snyder just joined us and he was in the 22nd uh, Squadron along with Ed White and Buzz Aldrin. So he's on the line, guys. We may get uh, we may get Major General Carl to join us here in a few weeks and talk about all the planes he has flown. Evie and Maggie, you got any questions over there? All right, so let me check and see. Jack, do you got a question? No, I don't. Uh, all right, so I tell you what, let's uh, let's see here. Let Hi, us, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I tell you this, why don't we, um, what, I, here's, here's the thing I would like for you guys to think about. I want you to do a little bit of research by a show of hands and you just raise your hand. Had, did you know that, did you know about Viking? Anybody this morning, did you already know about Viking? Oh, see, this is, okay, so Artemis, let's see, Darman, did you know? Okay, so Darman knew, but we don't have a lot of folks who've known about Viking. So here is your homework. I want you to do a little bit of research, come up with a question, email me that question. I will get it to Miss Rachel and then between uh, the next like week or so, we will see if we can't get those questions answered and then bring back Miss Rachel and some Vikings so we can tour her office and also hear from the actual people. I think my greatest takeaway, guys, is simply this. Do you realize that Dr. Benjamin Clark started his career and really has been working on all of these Mars missions for all this time? That's pretty profound. But you heard her say, the mathematicians weren't always the greatest writers. The writers weren't always the greatest mathematicians. The artists could see things conceptually, but maybe couldn't graph the trajectory of something. So that is why we need all of you, all of your yep. talents, all of your proclivities. But the good news is, guys, guess what? In a little bit of time, in a week from now, we'll have Miss Rachel back. We'll hear even more. And I got to tour her office yesterday. She's got some really great <laughs> stuff in there. So I want to make sure that we see it. But I know that you guys have got to get to some of your other classes. Miss Rachel, any last things you want to share with them before we go this morning? And I reschedule for you to be here next week. <laughs> You know, I think the most important thing is just to remember that each one of you has skills. You have a gift that you were born with. And then you have things that you can learn. And if you combine those two things and you're passionate about it and you don't give up, that's what's going to make you successful. So whatever you want to do, try it, build a team, don't give up and love what you do. And Miss Rachel also is, um, she has many patents out there. So if you like to 3D print something, she may very well be part of that patent for 3D printers. If you <laughs> like streaming services, like, like what we're doing right now, or YouTube or Netflix, she had a bit of a patent there. So know that this very, very smart, passionate lady found her inspiration <laughs> when she was a little girl watching science happen with her dad and Viking. So maybe as Perseverance launches this summer or what you've heard here in the last uh, couple of weeks with all of us has been kind of like your, your like part of being on that launch pad and it's part of that propellant and propulsion that's gonna launch a lot of your things. Guess what guys, one of our faves is back tomorrow. Artemis Westenberg, she's going to talk to us about women in space. Do not miss it. Now, on Thursday, I need to announce our time may change a little bit because astronaut Wendy Lawrence, it's a little bit early for her to do because uh, she lives uh, somewhere different than uh, us. So we're going to figure out the best time that we can get with her. So be watching for that update. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to unmute everybody and we're going to say... Goodbye and thank you to Miss Rachel. But if you if you do your research on Viking, send me a question. We're going to connect you with one of the people that actually worked on the mission, and we'll see Miss Rachel again next week. All right, you guys, everybody, say thank you, Miss Rachel. Thank you, Miss Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Hey guys, you know I love you. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for being Bye. awesome. Bye. 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 Bye.